Okay. All right. Um, all right. So I'll get started here. Um, so I'll be talking today about um, the intersection of soil health and integrated pest management, which I see as an argument for avoiding preventative uh, insecticides, really, but pesticides more broadly. Um, and I think you'll, uh, you'll understand what I'm getting at when I, as I get going. Um, okay, so I, I haven't been able to be as um, with the program this morning because I have uh, other things I had to get done. But I'm sure uh, Stephanie uh, has emphasized um, kind of details of soil health and how to generate soil health, how to pursue it. Um, so my point is just layering on top of that. So I'll simply start with some take home messages. That is, is if you value soil health, if you wanna grow soil health on your acres, um, you uh, need to protect it with IPM. So um, IPM is a, is a way of managing pests that um, doesn't use preventative insecticides unless absolutely necessary in certain circumstances. Um, Predators, if you can grow them in your fields or gardens or yards, you can help protect those plants that you care about. Uh, integrated pest management is the key to protecting these predators. Um, if you're growing uh, field crops or vegetable crops, cover crops can be improved, can you can be used to improve pest control. Um, and then pairing IPM with cover crops makes both more useful. And I'll kind of hit. So this kind of also stands as an outline for where, where we'll go today. So I'll hit kind of each of these topics in turn. Okay, so to give a little context and tell you where I'm coming from. So I'm the field crops entomologist for Pennsylvania, which means I work with large acreage crops like corn, soybeans, alfalfa, wheat, and the like. Um, I have a little bit of experience with, with vegetable production, um, almost none with kind of orchard work, um, but I certainly have my own yard uh, and, and um, I'm an avid vegetable grower. So I can speak about that um, if questions come from that angle. But a lot of what I'll talk about today, the context is field crops entomology, so large acreage crops. Um, so I will say that if these approaches can work in these large acreages, then I have to believe that they can work in even smaller acreages because the large acreage is, is, is the challenge. Okay, so let's get started. So uh, Pennsylvania is a no-till state. Um, as I said, I'm based at Penn State. Um, about 75% of our corn and soybeans and alfalfa um, never sees a plow. So it's no-till. Um, it's about 1.5 million acres. It doesn't um, hold a candle to the acreage out in the Midwest, um, but in the, in the East and the Northeast, it's a significant amount of acreage. And this no-till um, provides clear benefits in terms of reducing work, uh, reducing the amount of fuel needed to and drive tractors and other equipment across fields. But most importantly, it's a uh, water and soil conservation um, approach. I'm sorry for the pause. I got these weird things popping up on my screen. Um, so no-till was kind of invented as a soil erosion um, tactic. So we're trying to avoid as much soil erosion as possible. So by having, uh, um, by not disturbing the soil regularly, by not turning it over, we decrease the chances of it eroding. When we do till soil regularly, um, and then we get a good rain event, this is what we see. So this is a picture not too far from our campus here in central Pennsylvania. So that's a, a freshly tilled field being hit by a rainstorm. And you can see a lot of the topsoil is running across the road. So farmers, um, gardeners and the like value their soil. So to see it kind of wash away is, is disconcerting. So no-till is trying to avoid this on a daily basis. And Pennsylvania is a leader in uh, no-till production um, as are other states in the Mid-Atlantic region. So this map is a little bit dated, it's from 2012, but I haven't seen it updated yet. Um, it's using USDA data, showing the ratio of no-till to tilled um, land uh, in your large acreage crop. So Pennsylvania, um, uh, Virginia, Maryland, you can see are this dark blue color, which means about 75% or so of our acreage is in no-till. And uh, some, some big states in the Midwest are also no-till. And those places are no-till largely because 
of how dry they are. And no-till soil absorbs water better, allows the soil to hold water better, has a better soil holding capacity. So that's why those states are um, kind of prone to be no-till. On a regional basis, um, no-till is meant to avoid what you see in this picture. So this is a satellite image from 2011 when Tropical Storm Lee came across the Northeast. Um, and this chocolate colored line wiggling down the middle of Pennsylvania is the Susquehanna River. And this is the main river draining central Pennsylvania where, where I live and where a lot of farmers work. Um, and this is this brown color is Pennsylvania topsoil moving down to the Chesapeake Bay. So here's the Chesapeake Bay, here's the Delmarva Peninsula. Uh, Philadelphia is up here. Um, so this is what no-till is trying to avoid, but it got Tropical Storm Lee, which dropped uh, umpteen numbers of inches in a 24 hour period. It's very difficult, even if you're using no-till. So we can only do so much in the face of some weather events. There's been a kind of a bias against no-till for a long time now, because a lot of folks anecdot uh, believe and have anecdotally witnessed that there tend to be more pests in no-till. So it's a fear uh, that a lot of growers have when they go from a tilled system to a no-till system that essentially they'll be farming pests. Um, my research group has asked and answered this question in recent years. Um, and the answer is simply, um, no. So does no-till suffer more pests? The answer is no. It has an, an equal abundance of pests as do tilled fields. But the key is that the suite of pests is a little bit different. So in large acreage no-till fields like corn and soybeans, alfalfa and the like, we find pests like black cutworm, true armyworm, wireworm that aren't common in tilled systems. That's because that tillage is disturbing some portion of their life cycle usually. But the biggest notorious pest around um, these parts that we're doing no-till in is a non-insect animal called a slug. Um, I've shared this picture a lot. This is an image of a hay mower from Franklin County. This gentleman was mowing his hay uh, in the evening um, of early May uh, in 2012. And he didn't understand why his hay field was kind of languishing. And he got his answer when he happened to harvest at night. So these are all slugs across the front of this hay mower. Um, and uh, you can see, I, I meant to show that the, at the bottom here, you can see individual slugs, but it's kind of hard to see individuals in this nice sheen of animals. So slugs are a problem for backyard gardeners if you're growing peas or lettuce or um, spinach, those type of things in the early spring. But for field crop growers in no-till states, um, particularly on the East Coast where there's enough moisture, um, they are a pest of nearly everything that's grown in those no-till fields. So that, that would include canola, which isn't that, which isn't that common, but slugs love it. Uh, soybeans, of course, um, alfalfa and small grains, and then corn. And by a University of Delaware estimate, about 20% of the no-till acreage in the mid-Atlantic states um, loses yield uh, or stand establishment from slug damage. That's about 600,000 acres, which isn't a lot compared to the national acres of those crops, but it's a lot if it's your acreage on a regular basis can be frustrating. And just, just a, a few images of slugs doing their damage. Um, this is slug damage on soybean. The plant on the left is still living. You can see the cotyledons are still attached um, to the stem of the young plant, but the one on the right, the cotyledons have been fed off by slugs and that um, plant is gonna be dead soon, not gonna grow anymore. Um, oops. Uh, this is what a, you know, a soybean plant whose cotyledons are slowly going away, um, looks like, so that's kind of sad. Um, and this is a, uh, a cornfield in Lancaster County that has been replanted. Uh, this is after the third time, or no, I guess that's a soybean field, sorry. Um, so no farmer would be happy with that. You can see the large gaps in the, in the stands, just lack of green area in the early spring can be frustrating. Ah, so one of the benefits of no-till that's often um, not, let me get this thing out of here. There we go. One of the uh, side benefits of no-till besides holding on to soil and preventing erosion is that it makes conservation possible. So in this image, you can see um, soybean plants coming up through um, residue, particularly corn residue um, and some cover crop residue from previous um, crops. And in my mind, as an entomologist, 
that is great. So no-till makes conservation possible in part because it provides habitat for beneficial organisms. Uh, I just heard Stephanie talk about a lot of the beneficial organisms that can act as predators in crop fields. And that's, this is the type of habitat they would love. But to be frank, a lot of growers see this type of complexity and they get concerned that that is where um, the pests are going to hang out. So if you farm like this, you're going to have more pest problems, not more predators. So I'd say that's looking at, at the glass as being half empty. Uh, I'm trying to see it as half full. And this is great habitat for natural enemies. So then if you uh, adopt no-till um, and, and benefit from the stability that the system provides in terms of generating predator populations, if you add cover crops on top of that, then you'll have even uh, more diversity. Uh, and those uh, animals that populate those fields will grow this food web of interconnections between higher trophic levels, lower trophic levels, and the plants. Uh, and they'll start eating each other. And that's where the protection comes in. So as it's probably been mentioned today, uh, soil is a home to a lot of type, different types of animals. Um, and I'll include in that broad statement uh, microbes. But a lot of those animals are arthropods, um, which are uh, insects, uh, crustaceans, and their relatives, including spiders and mites and all those guys. Uh, and these animals, they, they feed. Uh, the, 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 the fuel of the food web is uh, kind of organic matter input. So this is an image you can imagine that's taken from a, a forest ecosystem, but the same thing is happening in crop fields if we provide enough organic matter input. You have fungi that colonize, you have um, uh, worms and mollusks that colonize different types of crustaceans, but layered on top of that, all types of arthropods. And at the top of these um, uh, trophic levels are the predators like rove beetles, ants, and ground beetles that can eat whatever kind of comes around. So in my mind, farming can be looked at as a way to produce diversity. We're putting more organic matter in the soil than more animals should respond to that. And if we treat those animals right, they'll stay around and be our allies in pest control. So Stephanie's probably gone over this, but I'll just hit it briefly. So soil arthropods do a lot of different things from uh, shredding organic material, kind of stimulating microbial activity by eating and then um, excreting. Um, they're doing all kinds of stuff. They, they enhance soil aggregation. Um, they burrow through and they make, they facilitate colonization by other animals. But the main thing that I'm going to focus on uh, for the rest of my talk is controlling pests. So uh, as you've probably heard, if you uh, want to establish or grow soil health on your acres, you need to farm with diversity and conservation in mind. So you start with no-till, you add a diverse rotation, and that diverse rotation includes cover crops. Right, to, by doing this, you're gonna build soil life. That includes uh, from the bottom up kind of microbes, so bacteria, fungi, uh, worms, and then the arthropods will come. And the arthropods in my mind will make the world a better place. So this step is called, you know, essentially is building soil life. The step that a lot of folks don't think about is then protecting that soil life. So protecting soil health and the way we should do that is through integrated uh, pest management. So integrated pest management simply asks you to value the, the life in your field. So scout to know what's out there. If certain pests are problematic, uh, we can refer to what are called economic threshold to know if that population is too big, then we should do something about it. But let's use insecticides as a last resort because oftentimes they're not needed. And if we take them out of systems and just apply them as necessary, oftentimes those beneficial arthropods, spiders and insects mainly, will be the natural enemies that can control the pests that, we, uh, that might show up. So integrated pest management, just a little background, I trust you've heard this term. Uh, the goal of integrated pest management is simply to use a combination of tactics. Those are biological, cultural and chemical tactics to control any pests that might show. Um, this was introduced by entomologists at University of California, Riverside in 1959. And it was introduced to do certain specific things. The first thing it was, done, uh, it was introduced to assure is profitability. So uh, back then there was a lot of resistance challenges. Um, farmers had gotten into the mindset of just spraying insecticides whenever they wanted to because it made them sleep better at night. They didn't necessarily um, do the intended 
task uh, that folks had in mind. But IPM introduced the idea of only using insecticides when you know there'll be an economic return. So the first step in IPM is ensuring uh, profitability. One of the ways we're gonna ensure profitability is by leaning on those natural enemy populations, by valuing them, allowing them to do the work that the insecticides did before 1959. If we rely on those natural enemies, then we'll avoid problems with uh, insect populations evolving resistance, and we'll avoid problems with those insecticides getting in places where they shouldn't be um, and being pollutants, whether it's in waterways or just in the soil itself. Unfortunately, kind of modern agriculture, typically when I think of modern agriculture, I'm thinking of corn production, soybean production, those types of things. Um, uh, the mindset in those areas for pest control um, has avoided IPM and uses a preventative strategy. Uh, this may be the case for some types of fruit and vegetable production, but I know those types of systems are far more based on IPM than uh, field crop production because fruit and vegetable crops have far more value. Um, and then you can, uh, IPM really helps dictate where insecticides uh, will provide a return on the investment. In large acreage um, production, the insecticides are just so darn cheap that it's, they're often just put out uh, without thinking about uh, the profitability involved in that system. Okay. So uh, because these insecticides um, you know, are a source of profit for a lot of large companies, um, they often use scare tactics to encourage their use. And I'll just provide a few images of some of my favorites that I've kind of gleaned from uh, magazines and, uh, and online marketing. Here's the first one simply showing that if you use this uh, Cru Cru Cruiser Max Vibrance, which includes an insecticides on your cereals, you'll have a fortress around your roots, which means you know, you're implying that there's, there's something to fend against. There's some marauding pest that's gonna come in there. So if you use this, uh, you'll have a fortress-like root system. Uh, this one from the UK, I never really understood what these, um, type of soldiers do, they look kind of uh, not, not very imposing to me, but I didn't grow up in the United Kingdom. Uh, but if you use this um, type of seed treatment, you'll be able to keep uh, pests out because you'll have a little extra muscle implying that you need it, right? Uh, here's one of my favorites. Here's a venomous snake that's chasing um, insects. Of course, venomous snakes don't eat insects. And venomous snakes often um, aren't, uh, don't look like plants. Uh, and artificial selection has often removed the power of plants to protect themselves. So we shouldn't need this insecticide if, if we uh, did plant breeding kind of a, with insect pests in mind. But here's my favorite one. And this is again, uh, advertising a seed treatment called poncho, which is often coated on corn. And here is an aphid. Um, so this is a um, scanning electron uh, micrograph of an aphid. And you can see the aphid mouth part here, which is its proboscis. It sticks this into the plant and starts to feed. But these clever folks have photoshopped teeth, craggly teeth uh, on the head of this aphid. I assure you, aphids do not have craggly teeth, but they do this to scare people because look at how nasty that animal is. It's got craggly teeth. We must need it, uh, must use an insecticide against it. I assure you, if you take those craggly teeth away, a lot of aphids are kind of cute. Um, well, that's a word I, I don't like to use. Uh, but to emphasize that they're trying to scare folks into using these um, chemicals because these animals that we're fighting against are creepy, scary, and out there to take your crops away. Despite this kind of shortcoming of the marketing of insecticides, I see them as valuable tools. They have a place in agriculture. It's unfortunate that the current place is that they are kind of overused. I would like them to be scaled back a great deal. Um, and historically, they've been overused. But, and I'm talking about foliar applied insecticides, soil applied insecticides, and, and seed treatments. So seed coatings is all often called one. They all tend to be overused because folks often think that there's an easier solution just by spraying something or deploying an insecticide than, than farming with natural enemies in mind. Um, I would far prefer that their use be dictated by integrated pest management, as I've already said, um, because if we don't, then there are these unintended consequences that IPM was invented to prevent. So decrease the number of good insects, you can make pest, pop pest populations worse. And then there's a, a whole environmental side, which I'm not gonna go into today. I heard Stephanie mention the neonics being water soluble and they can get in waterways. And that's certainly a concern. Um, some of my students have, have studied that. 
I'm not going to go into it today, but suffice it to say, if you go out to any waterway near you uh, in the spring, it's likely to have neonics. And a lot of them are likely to have neonics in them this time of year too, depending on the kind of intensity of the agricultural landscape that you live in. So using IPM should allow us to dial back the amount of insecticides being deployed. And that's only a good thing in terms of environmental health. And just to emphasize, um, any insecticide being deployed kind of does the same thing, whether it's just coated on a seed or spraying across an entire field, um, it's doing the same thing. You might get the um, impression that because it's a small amount of insecticide being put on the seed, it's not doing a whole lot, uh, but you'd be getting the wrong impression. See all insecticides as the same. They're all doing the same thing. Here's a figure from a good colleague of mine at uh, Cornell University. This is from Kyle Wickings, who's a soil scientist um, and kind of a entomologist combined up there at Cornell. He's in the Department of Entomology. Um, and he did a great experiment a couple of years ago in turf. He's a turf entomologist. Um, and he found that soil functioning is highest when we don't have any insecticides in the system. And as you uh, apply insecticides to a system, the function of that soil goes down. So this figure is a little bit complex. Let me just walk you through a little bit. So each of these, this is called a spider plot. And each one of these axes is a function that we'd like um, soil to deliver. So each one of these axes is a good thing. So high entomopathogen um, rate means that our, uh, if we have some pest insects out there, they'll be infected by entomopathogens, which are a type of fungi that can kill insects. Uh, decomposers are a good thing. We want more decomposers out there. The more decomposers we have, they're converting that organic matter into something a little bit more usable and making nutrients available. Macro predators are the predators we've already talked about, those things that lead pests. So all these things are a good thing. So we would like um, these polygons to extend out as far as possible on each of these axes. But you can see when we have no insecticides, the area of the polygon, that green polygon is the largest. But as we add insecticides, the area described by those polygons decreases. So as we go from blue to yellow to red, we're increasing the amount of insecticide applied showing that the amount of function we're getting out of this um, kind of plant soil system uh, is going down. So again, this isn't a turf system, but there's no reason to believe the same uh, type of uh, de decrease is happening in any other system, particularly the ones that I've been studying. So the more insecticide you put in, the less function you're getting out of your soil. Okay, let's take a quick diversion and just talk about the concept of predation and what benefits it can provide. Uh, in central Pennsylvania, there is a strong hunting culture. Uh, and when hunters go into the woods, they'd like to see uh, a deer or two uh, so they can harvest and enjoy that, um, that meat over the winter. In central Pennsylvania, what folks tend to see, however, is not many deer, but you do see great evidence that deer have been around because you see a, a very clean understory. So in this image, if you can't see it very well, we just have trees of various ages and a, and a leafy, um, dead leaf understory. So the leaf litter is all we can see. There's no plants growing there. And that's because this area is over browsed by deer. So deer come through and they, they wipe out any seedling that might be poking its head above the ground. A, a forest is not able to regenerate itself because there are too many deer. From this example, we can say, and we and you probably know this just walking through the woods wherever you live, we know that deer strongly influence forest regrowth. Okay. But we know if we eliminate deer, that the store, that the understory comes back. So there are a lot of kind of deer exclusion experiments going on around the world. They've been done for years. Um, here's an image of one um, from Michigan. What we have here is a, a fence going across this image. Uh, on the left-hand side of the fence, deer have access to that area and they've browsed everything down. On the right-hand side, deer are excluded by this big fence and you can see the understory is starting to grow. So there are saplings there are a lot of May apples and other things kind of regrowing. So these exclusion experiments reveal the potential impact of predators, meaning that if, if deer are kind of more afraid, they won't be as uh, happy to feed quietly. They'll actually be running for their lives and scared if there are more predators around. There's a natural experiment that's occurred for a long time now in the northern uh, peninsula of Wisconsin. Uh, way up there by the uh, uh, Sand Island National Park, wolves have persisted forever. They've never been extirpated from that part of the world. And there's a, a natural experiment happening. So up in that part of the world, there's a landscape mosaic of wolves. They are occupying some parts 
of that, uh, some parts of the world and not other parts of the world. And scientists have been able to define how long wolves have been in various patches of forests. You know, that wolves are wide ranging. So they had this home range that they kind of occupy and they stay in that kind of home range more or less. So this figure taken from this paper that was published in 2013 shows different kind of occupancy, occupancy levels, the different um, parts of the forest up there. So wolves have been around for either 10 years or more or very short periods of time for only one year, for example. And if you go into the forest in these uh, different patches of occupation time, you can see quite different things. And these are black and white pictures that I pulled from this publication, so not the best quality. But this image is taken from an area where, um, where wolves haven't been around very long, probably a year, two years or less. You can see much as I showed you in a previous picture where the understory isn't very diverse, mostly just see leaf litter. You don't see any saplings coming up uh, that can regenerate the forest. If you're in an area that wolves have been in for a long time, you see a, a much more diverse forest because you do have regrowth. It's, it's denser, the, um, seedlings and saplings are be able to establish. They're not getting browsed out by deer because those deer are afraid of being eaten. So they're a little bit more furtive, they're eating maybe only at night. They're careful about where they are because they know there's a chance that they might be eaten. So the question that I raise after introducing you to this idea um, is can we take advantage of this idea in agriculture? We know from examples like this that predators can protect plant growth and regrowth. The question is how do we do that in agriculture? We use IPM, we can build predator populations that can protect plants from pests. And here's a figure from some of my graduate students. The vertical axis shows kind of pest feeding damage in terms of a proportion. So a one, 100% of plants are being damaged, a zero, no plants are being damaged compared to the predator population. So I guess you can see here, the, as the predator population goes up, the amount of um, plants that are receiving pest damage goes down pretty significantly. And these predators, of course, are ground beetles, rove beetles, firefly larvae, and the like. So this example emphasizes that if we get better predator populations, we can decrease the amount of damage doing, uh, being done to our crop plants. And this outcome that I just showed you is being driven by ground beetles. Uh, ground beetles are kind of some of the, the main things to think about in terms of conserving soil-related predators. The larvae uh, on the upper left here are a subterranean kind of worm-like creatures that burrow through the soil and they'll uh, try to eat most things that they encounter. They have big old mandibles on the front. And the adults are also predators. So they're big um, active animals. If they run into a slug or a caterpillar, they'll eat it. I've really been focusing on ground beetles um, in, in the research that my group has been doing because they'll eat the early season pests that we're worried about in corn, corn soybean, and alfalfa production. So that is black cutworm, true armyworm, wire worms, and they'll also eat slugs, which is great. Okay, so let me take a quick diversion and talk about neonicotinoid seed coatings because that's where some of our research has really focused in recent years. And these things uh, certainly can protect yield. Uh, they're coated on individual seeds. When that seed is put into the soil, the water soluble insecticide is pulled into the soil by capillary action. And then when the plant starts to grow, its, new, its young root system is able to absorb that water-soluble insecticide systemically. So that insecticide runs through the vasculature of the plant and protects anything that might bite that plant, um, uh, whether it's a slug or an insect. Um, but the key is, is that animal needs to be susceptible. So a slug is a mollusk, it's not an insect, it's not susceptible to that insecticide. Many insects are susceptible to that insecticide. But anything that bites a leaf is going to get a dose of that insecticide. It's just a question of whether they're susceptible and whether the dose is big enough. So these seed coatings are providing systemic activity. Um, and it seems they're providing a fairly low dose because you just have a small amount being coated on a seed. You're putting that seed in the ground and it's protecting that young plant. In my hands at our central uh, central Pennsylvania research farm, we don't see any yield benefit from these things. And this is these data are similar to many other people's data. It's difficult to find consistent yield benefits from the, using these seed applied insecticides. I have a figure on the left from soybeans and the right on, on corn. 
and the red bars show where we have the seed code present, the green bars where we don't have the seed code present. You can see the yield is more or less equal in just these two years that I'm showing as a representative of the data that we get. Um, despite that lack of yield benefit, these neonicotinoids have taken off since about 2004. 2004 is when they started to be applied to corn and soybeans, so maize in red and soybeans in orange. And this strong increase over time has not been driven by any increase in pest abundance or different pest species arriving. It's been driven by a choice that agricultural companies made to start coating their seed with these insecticides. It's worth noting that in 2011, um, we, my, one of my former students, Maggie Douglas, did the analysis that we published from 2011 to 2014, the amount of insecticides being deployed as seed coatings doubled. And you can see that kind of evident in this picture. Um, it's basically driven by corn and soybeans. Fortunately, these data are no longer available. They stopped being available in 2014 and we can't do these analyses anymore. USDA doesn't provide this information anymore. If you haven't seen uh, maps from the US Geological Survey that kind of that show the amount of insecticide use coming across the country, I'll share some with you here. Um, this is the amount of clothianidin used in 2003. And clothianidin is the active ingredient in poncho, which is predominantly coated on corn seeds. And so the, the map is blank. That means there's none being used. So 2003, these insecticides were not used on corn seeds. 2011, you can see a lot of the Midwest a big chunk of Pennsylvania is being covered. And then 2014, it's those the same extent, but just darker. So these insecticides are being deployed and the amount of uh, insecticide being deployed per seed has doubled in that amount of time. So it's a little bit disconcerting, all this insecticides being put out, particularly when you have the information that it's not really benefiting yield very much. These insecticides coated on corn and soybean seeds are protecting against a very specific suite of insect pests. I list um, the main ones here. Um, the ones that are underlined are where the insecticide does particularly well. The one in parentheses does particularly poorly. Um, so aphids, black cutworm, I'm not gonna read the whole list, but these are some of the kind of typical actors that I run into uh, in kind of spring. Um, spring phone calls when I get uh, phone calls from farmers. But note that what's missing from this uh, figure are slugs, which happen to be the biggest pest that I've encountered since I've been on the job in these two crop species. Of course, slugs are mollusks, right? They're more closely related to clams and mussels than they are to insects. And if you wanna kill a mo mollusk, you should use a molluscicide. If you wanna kill an insecticide, sorry, an insect, use an insecticide. So that detail will matter in the, rest of the sto uh, story I'm gonna tell. So uh, when, I, when uh, some of my students and I had this question a couple of years ago, what do neonics do in the soil to pest populations? Are they actually controlling them or are they doing something else? This figure shows kind of the first glimpse of some of the data that we collected back then. Again, it's from that same former student named Maggie Douglas. Maggie found um, that slugs tend to be more abundant where we're using seed treatment. So these data are from cornfields. And the vertical axis here shows the number of slugs per trap. To trap slugs, we just put um, shingles in the field. These are white shingles you might have on your roof. And we just check them occasionally to see if there are slugs underneath them. And this is the corn growing season from May through October. The red line are corn plots where we had insecticide coated on the seeds. The blue line were uncoated seeds. So no insecticide is in the system. And on average, you can see over that growing season, we have more slugs where we had the insecticide coated on the seeds and we didn't. This of course raised our interest. So in the following year, we did an experiment to ask this very specific question is do these neonics coated on seeds exacerbate slug populations? So we did this at our research farm in central Pennsylvania. Um, we did this in uh, one large field and carved that field up into 12 different uh, plots. Uh, half of those plots received uh, soybeans that had a uh, insecticide coated on the seed and also two fungicides. So this is the Cruiser Max product, if you've heard of that. So there's two insecticides, sorry, two fungicides and insecticide. The fungicides aren't part of the story and I hope you'll see that, but I just, I'm not gonna go into details, but the fungicides have nothing to do with the results I'm about the show. And we can compare those Cruiser Max treated plots to untreated plots that had no fungicide and no insecticides in them. And these are big plots for entomologists for about a quarter acre 
uh, per plot. And I'll just walk you through four figures to um, see what I want you to see. First one is pretty straightforward. So slugs can decrease soybean yield. So on the vertical axis, we have yield here. The horizontal axis is number of soybean plants per acre. So as the number of soybean plants per acre goes up, the yield goes up. That makes great sense. We'd be worried if that wasn't the case, but notice the color of the dots. Where we have the neonic coated on the seeds, we have uh, fewer soybean plants per acre and we have lower yield. Here are the stats up there um, if, you're, um, if you're into that sort of thing. But note this is a field experiment. We're having R squared values that are up near nine, which is pretty great. Okay, so let's connect this to slugs. So we know uh, more plants uh, means, means greater yield, but more slugs means fewer plants. So in our experiment, as the uh, number of slugs per trap goes up on the horizontal axis, number of soybean plants per acre on the vertical axis comes down. So we have this negative relationship. But again, look at the color of the dots. Where we have the insecticide coated on the seeds, we have more slugs per trap and we have fewer soybean plants per acre, which means we have less yield per acre. So soybeans are limiting, sorry, slugs are limiting soybean yield. And then let's think about the predators. So in, in these same plots, we also trap for predators. We do that using pitfall traps, which is simply a cup that we sink into the ground and then predators will bumble into it. We'll go count the number of predators. So that's what's shown on the horizontal axis here. It's just the number of predators in our traps. The vertical axis is predation. So to assess predation, we take caterpillars uh, that we pin and we put them out in the field. We pin them to the soil and then we just assess um, how quickly they disappear. So something comes and eats that caterpillars. And we use that as a proxy for predation on other things. So this figure we see as the number of slug predators go up, the amount in our pitfall traps, the amount of predation goes up. There's this nice um, positive relationship. So more predators, more predation on these sentinel caterpillars. Um, but notice the color of the dots again, where we have the insecticides coated on the seeds, we have fewer slug predators, we have less predation. So that means that these insecticides are limiting the amount of predation that can happen in fields. And then let's relate this predation to slugs. So this figure shows the amount of predation. Again, that's shown as a proportion. These are the caterpillars being killed relative to the number of slugs in our trap. So as this predation on our caterpillars pinned in the field goes up, the number of slugs per trap goes down. That means two things. One, that these caterpillars that we're using as sentinel are are good proxies for slugs because the same thing seem to be eating both. Predation on caterpillars seem to be indicative of number of slugs per trap. Um, but also shows that predation can make a difference against slugs in the field, okay? Um, but notice the color of the dots again in this figure we, where we have the insecticide coat on the seeds, the black dots, we have less predation and we have more slugs per trap. So what we have here is the, these insecticides just coated on the seeds and planted are disrupting biological control. That's because the insecticide is getting from the plant um, and disrupting the predator populations. Okay, so that's a bad thing. So these insecticides um, have been pitched, uh, coated on seeds have been pitched as being relatively um, uh, innocuous when it comes to predator populations. But our data suggests they're actually uh, reducing uh, the abundance of predators and the amount of predation that they'll perform. So let's ask more questions about what these seed applied insecticides are doing. So I had a, um, a student that graduated a few years ago now, her name was Kirsten Pearsons. Now we call her Dr. Pearsons. She works in California now and she did a great experiment um, uh, testing uh, decomposition uh, in the presence of these insecticides without. So she deployed litter bags with a fine mesh and a, a, and a big mesh. And the amount of decomposing material kind of left behind in these bags is indicative of the decomposition rate, right? And so she um, had these bags in the field for various amounts of time. The, lo the longest the bags were out there were, um, were three years. So she collected them periodically, you know, six months, uh, eight months and kind of so on. Um, she weighed the amount of residue remaining in the bag, and she also extracted the microarthropods that colonize the bag, things like mites and springtails, to, to connect the abundance of animals to the function of decomposition. And she uh, um, plotted these data in this figure. So the amount of litter remaining is on the vertical axis kind of over the various seasons, and she did this in different batches. And we would expect that if there's more, um, so decomposition um, would occur 
faster, there'd be less litter remaining in the bag. So the more litter remaining in the bag is a sign that something, uh, that the process has been retarded somehow. So in batch two and three, we start to see that the amount of decomposition is, uh, the amount of material left in the bag is greater. So it means that decomposition is happening more slowly where we have the insecticides, these orange lines. And so she did this in five different batches, but just to summarize, after three years of use, we had about 10% more litter remaining in the bags where we had the insecticides compared to what we didn't. Um, and her, anal her analysis of the microarthropods that are colonizing these bags indicate that the difference seems to be driven by columbolins or springtails. So those insecticides are limiting springtail uh, uh, populations. There's less springtail activity and that, um, that translates into slower decomposition um, of the residue left in those fields. In a way, this could be contributing to slug problems. If you have more residue that's hanging out in fields and, and breaking down more slowly, then that's more kind of harborages for slugs. So slugs are more comfortable when they have places to hide. And if say corn residue is taking a longer time to break down, then you have large pieces of corn residue that are kind of harboring slugs and those, uh, that harborage is staying around longer. So this could be contributing to slug problems in addition to having fewer slug predators around. And here's a, a, uh, an outcome that was pretty surprising from, uh, from this uh, similar experiment. Uh, Kirsten and uh, her colleague, uh, Elizabeth Rowan have found that seed treatments are actually decreasing soil aggregate stability. So this was a, a three-year experiment we did comparing IPM uh, and a, to a um, preventative pest management treatment. The vertical axis in this figure shows aggregate stability. And aggregate stability is just a measure of how um, strongly soils are held together. And the image on the left, the, the clod of soil in this container of water is being held together by fungi and glues that are exuded by that fungi. And on the right, it has less aggregate stability. It's falling apart and it doesn't have as much resilience in that, um, in that water-filled chamber. So it's starting to fall apart. The one on the left is being held together by fungi and other things. Our, our experiment showed that when we have a cover crop in the system uh, and we're using IPM, you have a certain level of soil aggregate stability. Uh, but when we use preventative uh, insecticides, or we're using seed coatings, we have a pyrethroid put out at planting, the amount of um, soil aggregate stability actually decreases even in the presence of a cover crop. So the hatched bars here are where we had cover crops, the unhatched bars we had not. And the key comparison is this comparison between where we used IPM and had a cover crop compared to where we used a cover crop, but used for the preventative pest management approach, which is again, soil, uh, sorry, seed applied insecticides. So those seed applied insecticides are limiting soil aggregate stability. And our working hypothesis is that too is mediated by columbolins because columbolins move that fungi around. The more columbolins have, the more fungi you have and the more aggregate stability you'll have. So that's a surprising result that the seed treatments in our experiment seem to be decreasing soil aggregate stability mediated by these, um, these spring tails. Okay, so the bottom line in terms of what I tell farmers is managed for the pests that you have, right? Um, insecticides can make pest populations worse. They can decrease these decomposer populations like springtails. So using them in a way that they're not intended can have these negative circumstances. So if you have insect pests, then use the insecticides. If you don't have insect pests, don't use them. If you have slug pests, don't use them, okay? Um, in the few remaining minutes I have, let me just go through a couple points of optimism to show that this approach to farming can work. Uh, I'll first introduce the Penn State Diversified Dairy Cropping Systems Project, which has been in place since 2010. And it's an ex it's experiment meant to uh, test a, a different approach for growing all the uh, food, fuel, and fiber that your average sized dairy farm might need. And within this experiment, there are two different types of rotations. There's a simple corn soybean rotation that is kind of typical for a lot of parts of Pennsylvania and a lot of parts of the Midwest where cover crops are not used. Then we have more diverse six-year rotations um, that we think is a step in the right direction in terms of what farming should look like. In terms of insect and slug pest control in these two rotations, they're quite different. 
So in this two-year corn soybean rotation, we're using BT corn uh, seed treatments on both the corn and the soy, and we're putting a broadcast pyrethroid, which is a type of insecticide, out after planting, which is what a lot of farmers will do. And in the more diverse rotations, we're using IPM. So the students that work with me and I scout these plots regularly, and we put insecticides out only if necessary. We're not using seed treatments. We're not using transgenic um, corn that has insect-resistant traits. Um, and without going into too much detail, uh, the pests have been worse in this simple rotation because we have fewer predators. That's kind of the bottom line. I'll jump to that figure now. Um, so in these diversified systems that have no-till and a diversity of crops, um, we're actually building predator populations. So this figure shows on the vertical axis number of slug predators in our traps. We have this high input or kind of low diversity treatment, and we have this low input or high diversity treatment where we're using cover crops and the, and, the, um, and the rotation is more diverse. And these panels show the first six years of the experiment, year one, two, three, and then four. By year four, you start to see more predators in the low input system and that continues in five and year five and year six. So farming with the predators in mind is growing these predator populations and they're then able to protect the plants that were growing in those plots. This figure I already showed you, Again, it shows on the vertical axis the amount of damage um, to plants, the proportional damage to plants. And this is slug damage compared to the amount of predators in each of those um, plots. So as the predator population goes up, the amount of slug damage comes down, showing that this approach um, can work, at least at the Penn State Research Lab. So no-till makes conservation possible. Cover crops then add to it. Um, but cover crops, um, are fostering natural honey populations, but the only way to make them more effective is to protect them or allow them to do their job is to protect them with IPM. In another experiment that we've, we've done, Elizabeth Rowan directed this, we found that we get more carabid beetles when we have cover crops present. So this is carabid beetle uh, activity density, which is just kind of a measure of how many carabids are out there and how much they're moving around. Um, and this is total cover crop biomass. So you can see a positive relationship. If we have more cover crop biomass, we get more of these predators, which is a great thing. And if we have more of these predators, then that will help against pests. This example is, is white grubs, which is a pest of both corn and soybeans. It's the white grub density on the vertical axis, cover crop biomass on the horizontal axis. As cover crop biomass goes up, the amount of white grubs comes down. So it just emphasizes that cover crops are part of the solution. Cover crops are such a part of the solution that we have some growers in central Pennsylvania that are actually rolling their cover crop as a way to control their slug problem. So this is a, uh, a field at a farm about an hour east of State College. And this is a rye cover crop that has been rolled and planted corn at the same time. And the approach is being used to um, um, manage slugs. Uh, so a day or two after this rolling would have occurred, the farmer will come back and spray this cover crop with, a, with an herbicide, oftentimes glyphosate. Um, uh, glyphosate will slowly kill the cover crop and that slowly dying cover crop seems to be more attractive to slugs than the, than the crop that's gonna come up between these rows. So here's where the corn or the soybean will come up. And the slugs will prefer to feed in this thatch on the dying cover crop more than they'll like to feed upon the corn and the soybeans. This thatch is also providing habitat for natural enemies. It's also, as a third benefit, is also providing a great level of weed control. So we have farmers doing this now. If they're doing this, they often have this type of uh, uh, planter. So this is, a, um, this is a Kinsey planter with rollers on, on each row unit. Um, it allows a grower to roll the cover crops. So this is just providing emphasis that cover crops have uh, value. And if you really embrace a system like this, you can really get the predators to start working for you. Uh, there are even farmers el elsewhere doing the same thing. So here's a farmer in uh, Western Maryland rolling his crimson clover uh, cover crop. He's just uh, getting underway there, but I think it's a gorgeous picture showing that cover crops can have clear benefits uh, for pest control and they can be awfully attractive. And then if I get the farmers that are doing this to help me by visiting with me at a extension field event, talking to other farmers and community members, they can be advocates for this approach. And this is a guy named Lucas Criswell who farms east of here, who's 
um, uh, joined me for a field day to talk about our results together. And he's a member of the Pennsylvania No-Till Alliance. Here's a group of farmers that are dedicated to this type of farming. They're using IPM to decrease inputs and protect natural enemies and improve soil health. So in their mind, uh, no-till, diverse rotations with cover crops and IPM all combine to, con to improve soil health. Okay, so a few final, final thoughts here. I, I know I'm uh, out of time, um, but the no di diverse, um, so no diverse, sorry, no-till diverse rotations that include cover crops are how we build soil health. Um, uh, but to protect that soil health, we need, uh, we need IPM. So we wanna use um, IPM to direct that insecticide use um, as much as possible. So I'll finish with the take home messages uh, that I had up on the screen before. So um, that is no-till, diverse rotations, cover crops and IPM kind of all combined to make soil, soil health. Soil is alive, IPM can protect it. Predators can protect um, the crops from pests um, and then blind insecticide use can disrupt predator populations but cover crops can really add to the system. All right, I felt I really rushed at the end there but I wanted to end by 12.30 as the agenda indicates. So there I am, Stephanie, I'll stop sharing. I can be happy to take uh, any questions. Yeah, that's good. Or you can leave that, that slide up, John, or however you prefer. We definitely have some time here for questions. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, there are several for you in the Q&A. And I'll just try to, to moderate that and um, go through. A um, couple saying, thank you so much. Let's see. You may, since these were put in as you talked, I'm just going to go back up to the beginning. Um, asking about if the slugs you talked about, I think that's when you had the hay mower mm -hmm. pictured, if those are native species. No, yeah, Gary not, asked that question. Know. No, they are not um, a native species. And that's a key point. Um, they are um, exotic to the United States. They, uh, they originally evolved in Northern Europe, but now they are um, Kind of ubiquitous kind of cosmopolitan pests. They're on uh, every continent except Antarctica. So we're dealing with an exotic insect here and our native species um, can handle it but don't handle it well. That's why it's a numbers game. You need a lot of predators out there to deal with these slugs. Interestingly, some of the carabid beetles that I um, that we've studied and I kind of advocate for farmers to and I uh, build population of their farm, they're also exotic species. So we have an, a kind of a, a repairing of the uh, native range. One of those beetles is called Terosticus melanarius. Um, it's, a, um, it's a natural enemy in, uh, in Northern Europe. It was accidentally introduced into the United States and is doing a nice job controlling uh, slugs here. So it is not a native species. Not something you raised, but you may know the answer. It's um, asking about Japanese beetle uh, management. Is milky spore considered an IPM treatment, or do you have other suggestions? Ah, uh, right. So um, my limited knowledge of milky spore is that is a. Um, it's. Uh, I think that's a fungus uh, that's um, produced. So it's a, kind of a natural substance that is um, deployed against Japanese beetles. You're testing the, the limits of my knowledge here because I don't really deal with that, but um, that would be an IPM tool uh, and it would be more specific um, than a lot of insecticides you would spray across, um, across a field. Yeah, no worries. There's always a lot of good questions here. Sure. Um, Gary had a kind of comment question. Why do we use the term chemical for a pesticide when everything is made from chemicals? Yeah, that's just kind of tendency. Maybe it's lazy uh, wording. Um, I try to use the word insecticide as much as possible. Occasionally I use pesticide, which is a little bit too broad. My comments today were focused on insecticides, which are such a type of chemical, but it's a type of chemical used to kill insects. Um, I, I'll also respond to uh, Gary's other question where he makes the point that seed treatments may be overused, but in Maine, I do not see overuse by growers. Most of this overuse happens on homeowner gardens, uh, landscapes, and lawns. Um, I will disagree vigorously with that, Gary. Um, our research has shown that the great, great 
And actually, if I, I can share a screen, I can go back to a figure that I shared. The great, great, great majority of neonics are being used as um, insecticides on crop fields. And this figure shows that, um, that some of our research has uh, exposed that. What Gary um, is expressing is a common belief, but it is incorrect. Uh, there's gotta be a faster way for this, hold on. <laughs> let, me, let me find it. Um, and this figure, this figure is part of the story. Um, actually, I take that back. I have a very similar figure, but this, this figure shows the amount of neonics being deployed in the United States in this time frame. Um, the maize uh, and the soybean application of neonics dominates. And then we have cotton, fruit and vegetable, uh, orchard, wheat, and rice. So um, home and garden use isn't reflected in this other than that the active ingredients being used there are being used elsewhere. But this figure shows that the maize and uh, sorry, corn and soybean use um, for neonics is drive and cotton is driving national trends. It is not what homeowners are doing. It is the millions and millions, it's almost 150 million acres are receiving these seed coatings annually. And that dwarfs by every measure what's being applied in people's yards. So that is a misconception out there that I wanted to correct. I don't know if you intended to show a slide when you were just talking. I didn't see that, or oh, that's okay. Oh, forgive me. I think you. I think you stopped sharing to find oh, the slide. I, the would need to share. Yep, I found. Yeah. I showed it to myself. Doesn't that have some value? <laughs> okay, there you uh, go. Here, here's the slide that I that I uh, mm -hmm. that I mentioned. This isn't the ideal slide because it doesn't show kind of a lawn and garden sector, but it does show where the active ingredients are being used, and this use dwarfs what's being used in, in people's yards. And I'll also, also emphasize um, to the audience that this, um, this deployment of, um, of seed coatings, both on corn, soybeans, and all these other, and, and cotton, wheat, and all those things, that's not a choice that growers made. This is a choice that large agricultural companies made and then um, imposed that upon the marketplace. So now if you open a, a soybean catalog a soybean seed catalog or a, uh, a corn seed catalog, the great, 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 great majority of offerings have the insecticide coated on the seed. So the uh, industry has kind of boxed farmers in that if you want a particular genetics from a particular company, it's likely to come with an insecticide coated on the seed. If a farmer wants to avoid them, they need to kind of go outside this mainstream of the big companies and find the regional or local companies that are providing untreated seed. Um, so it, it's, yeah, it's not a, a farmer choice issue. Sorry, let me say that again. It, it's, get, it's getting to be a farmer choice issue because the large companies have constrained kind of the untreated choice so much. Um, so I would not, I don't lay this use on the kind of blame on the, at the foot of a farmer by no means. This is an industry-wide choice that was made to coat these seeds. And then farmers just have limited um, resources. So I uh, hope I didn't uh, anger Gary by disagreeing with him, but I do vigorously disagree with the homeowner state. Gary, Gary did like add some follow-up to say he wasn't disputing the national numbers. He was just speaking for Maine specifically that there are so few um, large well, so, crop growers there. Yes, yeah, they're very limited um, kind of corn and soybean growers from that perspective. Uh, I agree, but I would still say that each of those acres is probably receiving a neonic and it's likely to dwarf the amount that your neighborhood guys are doing. Even though you, you go into uh, the big box stores, you'll see all those insecticides have neonics in them. Um, in Maine, there seems to be a better sensibility of how to approach things. Uh, I have family there. I went to college there. I, I understand Maine a little bit. Um, yeah, so there were, I guess, just we also can make sure we're aware of the distinction between delivering neonicotinoids as a seed treatment versus other ways that they're applied to, to plants or landscapes. Um, we've talked about that a little bit. There was also some questions and comments in the Q&A about big box stores. Um, 
I, you know, we can't speak to what their policies are, so I, I don't know the answer to a lot of those. So you'd have to go to the source for that, but some, they've all kind of, no, they haven't, I haven't all. Some have committed to differing degrees of, of limiting um, either the use of neonicotinoids on the products they sell. I'm not sure if that's um, in seed treatments or not. And then also to what they're selling on the shelves. Yeah, so a lot of those big box stores wouldn't be coating seeds um, with neonics, but certainly some of the plants that they're um, they're selling often have neonics applied, so they're kind of pest free when they go to the to the consumer. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the, the big the big box stores, um, I, I, you said it well. I'll, I won't say any more. That to varying degrees, they're trying to get neonics off their shelves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did add one more thing about. I, it is in the e-packet of resources, but but Xerces developed a short decision tool kind of publication, making decisions about neonicotinoid seed treatment use in Iowa. It's not it's more Midwest in its focus than than Northeast, but I also just put that link um, in the chat again. Excuse me, John, go ahead. Yeah, I got a couple things. You mentioned um, uh, kind of neonics being sprayed on leaves versus the seed coatings. Um, Neonics being sprayed on leaves in, say, fruit and vegetable production have far more value um, than the, the insecticides being coated on seeds. Um, and they also have a, a quite a different um, kind of toxicity profile. The insecticides being coated on seeds, the active ingredients of neonics being coated on seeds, are incredibly lethal to beneficial insects. Oftentimes, the ones being sprayed on leaves in orchards or vegetable production are quite mild. On insects, they have a quite a different um, strength against beneficial arthropods. So a lot of the neonics being used as sprays in fruit and vegetable production are quite different animals than the ones being coated on seeds. And it's my opinion that if we didn't have as many coated on seeds, um, as if we didn't have as much acreage being covered by seeds coated with neonics, we'd have far less of the environmental concerns we'd have because that those applications on um, fruit and vegetable fields are much more mild compared to the higher toxicity of the things coated on seeds. Um, there's also a question in the, in the chat about uh, using BT corn without seed treatments. Um, it's, very, it's getting, as I said, it's getting very difficult to find them um, because seed companies are selling these things as a package. If you can find BT seed without a neonic on the seed, I'd encourage you to buy it. But I would, um, I would say you're going to have a hard time finding it unless you have a seed um, dealer that's a really good friend. Yeah, that's something I guess, you know, we just encourage people to be aware to ask their seed, seed dealer what is really coming on the seed and ask for any alternatives that they, that they don't necessarily want to get. Mm -hmm. Got to also show the demand side of it too. Um, John, there's a few about... Glyphosate. So, one, why do cover crops need to be killed with glyphosate? Mm -hmm. um, are there alternatives? Yep. And then, related to that, was you find it um, the effects of glyphosate on soil organisms. Right. Um, so, the only influence of glyphosate on soil organisms that I'm aware of is that glyphosate has been shown to change the microbial community um, in the soil. Um, so it's a community shift that occurs. Um, I know there's a, a fair bit of um, controversy about glyphosate in, in some circles. Um, I guess I would, way I, my stance on glyphosate is that it's the lesser of two evils or many evils perhaps. So um, in the large acreage crops that I deal with, if we want cover crops to be used, um, killing them with a relatively um, less toxic herbicide seems to be a cost of doing business. So if you could, if you could roll those um, cover crops with a roller crimper and be assured that they wouldn't regrow, that could be a viable option. On the, if, you're, if you're dealing with say 2000 acres on a farm, that's not as viable an option and then mowing isn't as viable an option. So the herbicide kind of makes this system possible. So glyphosate in a large, to a large degree has enabled no-till 
to happen. And, and that's a good thing. So, um, you know, farming is all about choices. So we want our soil to remain in place. One of the ways to do that is to use no-till. One of the ways to improve the functioning of no-till is to add a cover crop. Um, I've just kind of come to accept glyphosate as part of the system. Um, and I know there are various data out there that shows various things that's in, interpreted in various ways, but I see an overall benefit of glyphosate enabling conservation-based farming. And I, I, I know that might be ironic to some that glyphosate use is enabling conservation-based conservation farming, but it is. The no-till that's happening in the Mid-Atlantic and those Western states couldn't happen without glyphosate. So I see it as a necessary part of the equation, at least at this point, because rolling your cover crops or mowing the cover crops just don't have the same uh, effect. So I yeah, guess that's all I I'll think to, to, to that point, it's, it's a learning curve for farmers. It's a, a more complex system to manage when you're working yes. with cover crops and figuring out how to terminate them and what your cash crops are and what your climate is and then even what your year-to-year -year weather patterns are so just having another tool in your tool belt about how you can terminate um whether it's with with the herbicide like glyphosate or physical means like the roller crimper or mowing or if you're you know you've got the climate and the cover crop combination that you get a winter kill um yeah I think this is back to the uh, effects of glyphosate on invertebrates. This, there is some data done on honeybees, and it, it's also related to the antibacterial properties of glyphosate that also um, honeybees and, and invertebrates have microbiomes in their digestive systems also. So that's another indirect effect um, where the diversity of their di of the microbial community in their digestive system can be reduced or killed off by exposure to, to herbicides, also just making them less, less healthy and less robust. Um, all right, let's take two more minutes here to, to go through any remaining questions. Let's see, you're asking about the name of the entomologist from Cornell. I think that's Kyle Wickings, is that yep. correct? Yep, Kyle Wickings, yep. you got it. Kyle Wickings, okay. Um, So do you want me what to else? tackle this? So, Pick. so yeah. Lily, so Lily asked, well, "What predators eat um, scarab grubs?" And I, so, scarab grubs um, have some specific things that attack them. But all I'm advocating for is just growing the general predator populations. So that would be ground beetles, rove beetles, firefly larvae, uh, soldier beetle larvae, and the like. And some of those things are going to work for for Japanese beetles. But it's difficult to, to grow a population of one specific predator that's going to do one specific thing. So in my mind, it's, it's just a numbers game. The more predators you have in area, the better off you're going to be. Uh, and uh, Steph, I'd like to answer this uh, question by uh, Brendan Peck. Um, Peck. Brendan Peck um, said that IPM has the science showing why it can be more profitable than preventative pest management. However, the difference between the two strategies uh, yield is not intuitive. How do farmers gain trust and buy-in. Um, uh, Brendan, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a good, those are good points. Um, in, in, in our hands at our research farm, we get the same, more or less the same yield when we're using an IPM approach or avoiding insecticides entirely or, um, or using a preventative pest management approach. Um, how to get buy-in is have growers try it. Um, so I encourage growers to not believe what I tell them but to go find out on their own acreage. Take a small field um, where you're willing to try this, plant an untreated seed. Uh, don't put an insecticide in with your herbicide applications like as a tank mix. Um, have a, have a, um, a high bar of tolerance the first couple of years to allow those predator populations to grow. Um, work from the United Kingdom has shown that it takes three to five years for predator populations to kind of reestablish and, and, and grow to significant levels to be able to contribute in this, uh, in this way. Um, during that three to five year period, a grower needs to be patient 
and um, think of the long-term goal that, uh, for managing that field. Um, while that period's going on, uh, you have IPM at your disposal. So if a, if a certain insect population comes along um, and starts to cause problems, you can apply um, an insecticide if that population exceeds the economic threshold. There are things you can do. I'm not asking you to sit back and just wait for your crop to be ruined by an insect pest. Um, if you have slugs, you can deploy slug baits, which are, um, which are um, effective or can be effective and are very targeted to slugs. They're just gonna influence slug populations. There's not many non-target effects of, uh, of slug baits. So it's, it's firsthand experience, it's, it's patience, and it's uh, kind of the long view uh, are things that can get um, people to buy in. Um, but you have to recognize that the option, the other option is kind of the, the typical system. And that typical system is being pushed by every seed dealer and chemical dealer that drives down your lane, or every time you go to the farm store, they're, they're talking about, what's that crazy stuff you're doing? I hear you're not using a seed applied insecticide. Why aren't you putting insecticide in your burn down? So the, the industry standard is pushing against this approach. So to do it, you also have to have a personality that is, um, that is perhaps, uh, I don't know, can withstand some of that pressure from these outside forces. But firsthand experience is, is kind of the way to get buy-in. Yeah, I, th I think that's one of the most exciting things about the soil health movement is that it's kind of outside of um, what you can buy or sell. It has a lot to do with, with knowledge and management choices and experience. Um, and that makes it both have a lower bar for entry, but also a higher bar in a way that, that there's this learning curve. Yeah, what, um, what, I, what I try to advocate for is to if I have, have growers find other growers in their area that are doing kind of these um, kind of progressive practices and go talk to them, brainstorm with them, figure out what you can implement first and then, and then take small steps to implement it. 